Okay, so pondering protein. This is a big topic. You know, everything, everything's all the rage is about protein. Um, and, and before we start, I just want to give a few disclaimers. I don't get any financial compensation from any groups or any particular, um, you know, any industry out there. This is just me. Um, I do have some personal biases, you know, that I want everyone to be aware of. So you know where I'm coming from. I, you know, I do love animals and I would love it if we didn't eat animals, but I am not a vegetarian. Um, I don't eat red meat, but I do eat everything else. Um, and I am worried about climate change um, and know that eating plant foods does leave a lighter carbon footprint. So I do have that, that bias. But that said, my goal here is to give everyone accurate information. And, you know, if you have knowledge is power, as we all know, and if you have the, the, the you have a right to accurate information. And my hope is that armed with that inf information, um, you are then the best person to make the right choice for yourself and you're making an informed decision. And if, you know, I'm not by any means an expert. So if there's anything that I get wrong, you know, bring it to my attention, I'll look it up. Um, you know, so I am not infallible by any means, but this is just a good faith, faith effort on my part to just get to set the record straight on some of the things that we've, as a culture, really um, been accustomed, accustomed to, and to challenge some of these ideas, these, these entrenched ideas that we have as, as a society. So having said that, I'm just going to move on. And this isn't a very long talk. I haven't timed it, but it's just a few slides, maybe a total of like, I don't know but it shouldn't be too long. <laughs> so I know this sound, this looks like a horrible uh, screen here, but just to kind of, for me, it just helps to understand things at a smaller level and then build from there. But our proteins are made up of building blocks. You can think of them as like Lego blocks or beads on a, on a, on a, on a string for a necklace or something. And they're called amino acids. And I don't know if you remember our, um, if those of you have watched the video on fats, so I had a similar screen with sort of the structures of the different kinds of fats. And so, you know, we have um, uh, about 20 amino acids, but there are nine that are essential. And the essential ones are the ones that have the dotted uh, circles around them. And essential meaning, just like essential fats, right, is that we, our body cannot make them. We have to get these essential um, amino acids from food. So, so um, one of the things just to just to note, and in, you know, at some point, not in this talk, but in another talk, I'm going to refer to the um, the branched chain amino, amino acids of isoleucine, leucine, and valine. Um, there is this kind of a branched chain. And so at some point in future talks, I'm going to refer to those because they do play a role in our health um, on the kind of protein we eat. Um, but in any case, don't need to, you know, ponder this too much, but these are sort of our little building blocks of proteins and aren't they pretty? All right. So the next slide is, you know, so what are proteins, right? What are they essentially? And you know, I talked about the building blocks. And if you think about these little beads here, you know, as, as those amino acids, our body, you know, when we take in food, we break down the protein into those little individual beads of the building blocks. And then we restring them together. Our body strings them back together and creates new proteins, proteins that, that we need, right? And, and you can think of them as, you know, this picture down here, we're creating little beads, right? But really what they look more like is this other picture up here. And there's hundreds and thousands of different kinds of proteins. We don't even know all the different kinds of proteins that exist and they look very different, right? And the way they end up bundling together and shaping together kind of connotes what role they play in our body. Okay, so that just gives you an idea what are proteins. And so what do they do? You know, every single cell in our body has protein in it. So we are 
made of proteins, the different kinds of proteins. You have the structural proteins that hold our body together, like the collagen that gives the structure our skin and bones and teeth. And then there's keratin for our nails and hair. Um, we have enzymes, if you remember from high school biology, where you know, they sort of, they break down, there's chemical reactions, break down the foods we eat, um, take things apart and help build something else so we can function, um, uh, our nervous system. So our, our body is full of protein. Every cell in our body has protein in one form or other. So this slide is just just signifies our worship of protein. You know, protein is like, oh my God, we're always obsessing, right? As a society, I need enough, I'm not gonna get enough protein if I eat that or if I don't eat that. And, and so um, this cartoon, I just thought like, just sort of signifies our worship of protein. And also the fact that protein in our culture is synonymous with meat. Um, and that meat is protein and protein is meat, right? And that pro meat is the only source of protein. It's a great source of protein, um, but it is not the only source of protein. And it is completely understandable why we came to believe what we do. Um, and I think it's important in order for me to just, for us to understand how we got to where we are, I think it's important to just look back at the history and how we got here. And I think, knowing that, armed with that information, I think it's easier for all of us to kind of understand kind of how we, how we got here. Now this guy, uh, I'm just gonna do a quick history lesson. I know maybe some of you guys are rolling your eyes like, oh my God, we're gonna get a little history lesson. But I just, history was like actually my first major and then I switched over to nursing, but so I always have a little thought for history. Oh, Brenda's here. Um, I have a little soft spot for history. So um, this, this, um, okay, hold on a minute. Yeah, um, so, so protein was discovered by a Dutch chemist, this guy named Gerard Mulder, and he deemed it the most sacred of all nutrients. Um, and the word protein comes from the Greek word, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it properly, um, prote pro proteos, and it means of prime importance, right? And of course, you know, we believe pro protein is of prime importance because it is, it, it makes up literally every cell in our body. So, so there's no surprise that protein is synonymous um, with, with importance, right? So just moving on a little bit, um, you know, it's really no surprise that protein is synonymous with meat. Protein is the core element of meat and in animal-based foods. Early nutrition scientists believe that the more protein we ate, the better we, we are off we are. Um, a lot of their students followed suit. It also became a symbol of wealth and civilization because it's harder to get, it's more expensive. So there's some status connected with meat. And so this other guy here that I have a picture of, um, Wilbur Olin Atwater. So he is known from the, from the research that I read as the father of modern nutrition. No doubt there's a woman in there somewhere, but we're not getting credit. <laughs> um, but um, he actually, on his trip to Germany, uh, found, learned about this concept of calories, right? So he got really excited about that in the mid 1800s. And he came back to the United States and he was intent on bringing scientific rigor to the infant science of nutrition because there really wasn't much rigor. It was sort of, um, you know, old wives tales and, you know, uh, trial and error. And so he was insisting on, on coming to youth to the US and bringing this, this rigor. And back then it was thought that just food was simply fuel, right? That is just, it was just that simple. It was just calories. There's really no understanding of nutrients, of um, micronutrients, vitamins, all of those things. Um, and so the concept of empty calories wasn't a part of the, you know, vernacular back then. So it was simply fuel, fuel, it, fuel. it was just a matter of, of calories. So the foods that had the greatest calories were the better foods. 
And meat in those days, because there's no junk food, keep in mind, right? Meat in those days was really had the highest number of calories. And, um, and so that was deemed to be the best food. Um, and actually he was the person that actually, I believe, um, studied, you know, part of his study was to actually determine how much calories each, all of our foods. So he worked out the calories for all, most of the known foods that we, that we uh, are aware of our basic, the, you know, most of our basic foods. So he did all of that research. Um, so in contrast, right, because meat had so much, so many more calories, you know, it all, so this added to its fame of being just the best food. In contrast, fruits and vegetables were considered inferior because they were so much lower in calories, right? They're just infinitely lower in calories. So they were considered inferior for poor people. Um, and, and, and his recommendation was that we eat two pounds of meat a day. And, uh, and if you think about what our requirements are now, right? The, um, USDA, the RDA requirements is 46 to 56 grams of protein a day, keeping in mind that a gram is, you know, uh, is like if we just pick 55 grams, for instance, that's just under two ounces. And recall that three ounces is the size of the palm of your hand. So, so it's really, you know, he was advocating for a lot of meat back then. Um, he, had a stroke at age 59 and died three years later at age 63. So, you know, that kind of tells you something. Um, he had a very important role though, because of all of his research, he was the chief of human nutrition investigations, the USDA at the USDA and really set the narrative centering our source of, you know, centering our source of protein around meat. Those that his students and those that followed him kind of followed suit. So he sets that stage. And then we went on to the 1960s and 70s where hunger and malnutrition in poor countries was where we were becoming more aware of that. And so it was determined by experts at the time that it was due to lack of protein, which, you know, that definitely was part of it. And so the assumption was that meat protein was the problem that they weren't eating enough meat. Um, so the UN, the US, other governments around the world and major universities jumped on this assumption. And of course, we now realize that it was because these populations were relying on very limited number of plant sources, you know, and we'll talk about plant uh, proteins because it is different. There is, you know, there are differences and it is quote unquote inferior in ways so that we, we will explore. But, um, but really the problem was that there was a lack of variety of plants and not you know, and you know, no, they didn't have meat, very much meat, but they, but if they had had adequate plants around, they would have been able to, they, this wouldn't be a problem. Um, so, because we now know, now research has since shown that there's entire populations that eat very little animal protein and do not suffer malnutrition and in fact are far healthier than we are if we look, for example, at the blue zones. Um, so we can finally finish off this slide. So just a question, right? Which one has more protein per calorie, the steak or the broccoli, right? And this blew me away, um, you know, that actually 100 calories of steak, 100 calories of broccoli, you have eight grams of protein and 11 grams of protein in the broccoli as opposed to eight grams of protein in the steak. And then if you look, the fat difference is huge, right? Um, so the steak is packed in cholesterol and saturated fat, which we talked about in the fat in the fats um, lecture talk. And then broccoli has fiber and phyto phytonutrients and things that really help prevent disease. So, um, but then that's confusing, right? It's like, well, plants aren't a complete protein, right? Like, what the heck's going on with that? Or you know, uh, I, I won't have. But won't I have to eat like a whole mountain full of plant food to get enough calories and protein? So this is always the confusion. This was my confusion. It's like, this doesn't make any sense to me. So, um, so let's talk about this then, right? So let's just talk about, um, you know, the farm animals, the animals we eat, right? We have to remember that all protein ultimately comes from plants and then they move through the food chain and we then eat them, right? So our cow that we eat that the steak that we eat, well, that cow ate grass. So clearly 
you know, the, the animal proteins that the cow is eating is, is coming from plants. Um, so that's just an important perspective that to, to think about. Um, okay, the next slide is, so let's just talk about this concept. First, let's address this concept of incomplete proteins, right? So this was, you know, it's a, it's sort of a misconception and it was inadvertently promoted and popular, popularized by this um, sociologist. She wasn't a nutritionist or a physician, um, you know, but she was a sociologist and she, her focus was try to end, trying to end world hunger. Her, her name was Frances Moore LaPay. And in 1971, she wrote a book called Diet for a Small Planet. And it stated that plant foods are deficient in some of the essential amino acids. So in order to be a healthy vegetarian, you needed to combine certain plant foods at the same time in order to make sure you have all of the essential amino acids um, in the right amounts. And so it was called the theory of protein complementing. And in this and later editions, she corrected her earlier mistake because we don't need to eat them all at the same time. Our body is really good at, you know, taking a little bit from here, taking a little bit from there. So if you have, if you have some plant proteins one day that don't have all the amino acids, if you, you're gonna get them the next day. And so it'll kind of slowly collect. So it's sort of a more slow and steady way of collecting all the required protein, uh, amino acids. And then you get, you do get what you need. So you don't need to have them at the same time. Our body is able to store all kinds of nutrients and then use them just like we do as human beings, right? We, 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 we see a gift for a friend or card, right? And we collect, oh, that looks like a great thing. I'm going to just hold on to it. Oh, and then when the need arises, oh, I have one there and I don't have to run out to the store. So it's sort of the same concept. So you can see, you know, that indeed from this slide, right? These are the essential amino acids that I referred to in the beginning. You know, we've got these these uh, essential amino acids that our body cannot produce that we have to get from food, right? So um, you can see that meat does indeed have more of those, you know, all the different kinds of meat do indeed have more of those amino acids. So that is where, you know, it is quote unquote, it is a higher quality because when you're eating the meat, you're getting pretty much all the amino acids at the same time and you're not having to. But having said that, the plant sources do have, you know, if you're having just any combination and this doesn't even list all the different kinds of plants you can have. I have a separate slide that can explain that a little bit better. Um, but you, you know, there are, you, you can totally get a complete protein once you, you know, when you, in, in the course of eating plant food. So it's not an impossible, impossible feat and it's, it's entirely doable. Um, so this is just another, um, this is just another look at the complete protein. So you can look at other foods here, the, the, you know, the different kinds of vegetables, you know, fruits or vegetables that we eat. Vegetables have much more higher protein content than food. Um, so this is from the USDA nutrient database. So you can see that you can pretty much get like all of the essential amino acids from the, our most common, um, our most common, plants. Okay. So you can see here, like an, another thing is that some of our largest animals on earth are plant eaters, but they do, having said that, you know, just to address the other concern, well, then I don't have, I'm not going to, I can't sit all day and eat all of these plant foods. I mean, how am I going to get the number of calories that I need, right? This doesn't make sense. I can't, you know, so trying to just wrap our heads around that, of course. Um, so how much protein does the average American eat in a day? Um, and, and how much protein are we supposed to eat in a day, right? And so I, I remember, I, I mentioned earlier that the, the RDA recommends, you know, anywhere between 50 to 60, 46 to 56, it just, you know, uh, grams a day. Um, so, so remembering that like 55 grams is a little less than two ounces and three ounces is the size of your palm. So that's really how much protein we need a day to just to kind of keep things in perspective. Now the average American eats about 
70 to 110 grams a day. So we're getting a lot more protein than we need, most of it from animal protein. And if you think of it by contrast, you know, so 97 Americans get, get adequate or more than adequate amounts of protein. That's 97% of us. And if you contrast that to the fact that three, only 3% 3 of Americans get the recommended amount of fiber, but we don't talk, well, we talk about fiber, but not, you know, not really. I just feel like um, there's so much more emphasis on protein. Um, I don't think fiber has a lobby <laughs> or an industry, although we are, you know, we do have some Metamucil and all those things, which are good. Um, but only about 3% of Americans get a regular recommended amount of fiber, which I was blown away. That really surprised me because I actually, I think now that I think about it, I probably don't get nearly as much fiber as I should. So what would, what would a meal look like? Greg, like say, say we, you know, worst case scenario, we, we, we couldn't have any meat, right? Um, if we were just looking at a plant-based diet, which actually is a far healthier diet. Um, I can do a separate talk on that because that was pretty eye-opening too. Um, if we look at the actual research, the China study, all of these really, um, you know, uh, powerful pieces of research that have come out recently, just really evidence-based research. Um, so if we're looking at, and I know, you know, um, Brenda, we talked about the the daily dozen from Dr. Michael Greg Greger's recommendation. And so I just use that as an example, like, so what would it look like, right? If we were just gonna try to get as much proteins. Um, so I kind of try to ran this experiment and add it and calculate it myself just to kind of see. So I just looked at, you know, how much each of these, how much protein and how many calories each of these items would have if we were to just try to follow Dr. Greger's daily dozen and just see exactly how much, how much do we actually come up with. So if we have a cup and a half of beans that he recommends three, you know, servings of beans a day of whatever kind, that's 18 grams of protein and 327 calories. If we have a half a cup of blueberries, that's 0.5 grams of protein and 42 calories. One apple is 0.5 grams of protein and 95 calories. A banana is 1.3 grams of protein, 105 calories. An orange is 1.2 um, grams and 62 calories. If we look at a half a cup of broccoli, that's one and a quarter grams of protein and 15 calories. If we look at two cups of spinach, we have it's one gram of protein and 16 calories. You have a half a cup of carrots. That's about half a gram of protein and 25 calories. One cup of mushrooms, 2.2 grams and 15 calories. A tablespoon of fl flaxseed, that's two grams of protein and 55 calories. We do a quarter cup of walnuts, that's 8.6 grams and 90 calories. And then we have a half a cup of steel oats, that's four grams of protein, 340 calories. And then if we do two slices of you know, whole grain bread, that's six grams of protein, 200 calories. So then that, so I added it up and the total comes to 47 and a half grams of protein, which is within the recommendations. And it's, only, and it's 1400 calories. So his idea is not that, that we're gonna live on 14 calories a day, but his idea is if we just do the daily dozen, his daily dozen, um, and part of the daily dozen, which is not on here is, is a dose of exercise. And I think another one he added was B12, because that is absolutely one thing we cannot get from plant, you know, which is why it's healthy to have some animal protein somewhere in the diet at some point, unless you really don't want to do it. And, you, you know, you have a philosophical, um, reason not to, then you have to take B12 supplements. So that's absolutely one thing we do need. Um, but that adds, so his idea is that we, if we just do this basic, right, and then we're getting enough fiber, then we're going to meet that requirement. We're going to not have as much of, we're going to get our omega-3 fats, which is the healthy fat that we need, that we're not getting enough of, that I've talked about in a previous. So, and then our health outcomes, you know, uh, if we look statistically are far better when we look at the research, it's just undeniable. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not a vet, I don't like vegetables. I'm not good at eating vegetables. So it's not something I personally want to hear, <laughs> but, but, um, 
you know, it's, it's, it is the reality. Um, and knowing that reality, we can then make an informed decision of how we want to move forward. Um, so anyways, that was kind of interesting to, to learn. Um, so just this last slide just looks at, you know, the essential amino acids once again, and, you know, some of the foods that have all of these essential amino acids. So you can see it's quite a variety. Um, and, and, and what, um, you know, Dr. Gregor in reading his book, you know, what he says is that, you know, when your calorie needs are met and assuming you're eating whole foods, we really don't want to, we don't really need to overthink this as much as we do, but assuming you're eating whole foods, you know, when your calorie needs are met, your protein needs are automatically met. Your fiber needs are going to be met. Your omega-3 needs are going to be met. And so any assortment of plant foods that are around a thousand calories will give you 30 to 40 grams of protein. And, um, you know, and in general, the sentiments of the general population tend to be behind the science, which is, you know, what we're seeing in this case. And it, and it takes, you know, it takes a long time for the science to get out there and reach the general public. Um, and, um, you know, if we think about, say, for example, the tobacco industry, right, for a long time, we didn't believe that tobacco, there was a link between tobacco and lung cancer. And so, and now finally, that science has caught up and the message has gotten out to the regular population. Um, and, and it will be the same for, um, for this as well, as more and more, um, the youth especially are, seem to be at least quite um, savvy. Um, and uh, Hopefully they will continue to be so, at least the, the, the youth that I'm in contact with. <laughs> so, all right, so I guess that's it. And then we can just have a discussion and I will stop the recording. Um.